Good morning everyone and welcome to my channel on two and four wheels in which we are going to talk about the world of professional cycling and from time to time Formula 1. This will be my secondary channel in English as I have one in Spanish with a thousand subscribers and I will be uploading videos on these two topics. This is my first video in this channel and we are going to analyze the performance of each of the teams that have participated in this edition of the Vuelta España 2022 that ended a few days ago, placing them in a ranking from worst to best, from the 23rd to the 1st. In order to evaluate each team, I have taken several questions into account. If they have achieved the objectives or expectations they had proposed for themselves, their tactical performance, how they perform in the general classification, the GC, if they have taken any stage victories or if they have been present in the breakaways, and the casualties they may have had during the Vuelta, whether for Covid or other reasons. So, having explained all the criteria, remember that you can always like the video and subscribe to the channel. Let's begin the analysis of the 23 squads. The team with which we started ranking, and therefore, the worst of all this Vuelta is Lotto Sudal. We can't deny that they had the weakest lineup among the World Tour teams, that they started the Vuelta with very bad luck with the withdrawal of Steph Kras, their man for the GC, and that they have been very, very badly affected by Covid. But did they stand out at any point in the race? Their best chance of achieving something was to be in the breakaways, and although Sweeney was in Herrera's day and Conca did a very good job in a couple of stages, there were many days when they didn't get into the breakaway, like the massive ones on the stages 12 or 15. Van Gils and again hardly ever made an appearance and only the top 10s in the sprints of Belens are worth mentioning, if that. Very, very poor performance. Lotto is followed by Israel Premier Tech, who also lost their mind for the overall Michael Woods in the early stages. Einhorn also went home early and they only came close to victory on stage 5 with Daryl Impey. Did they do anything else? Goldstein and Demarkey were in several breakaways but didn't have the level to get a victory in any case. Hagen suffered a nasty crash and did what he could and Froome and Vevin came on a field trip, with the Kenyan richest rider in bad shape because of the Covid he caught in the tour. Bit little, to be honest. And the team that completes the negative podium is Arkea Samsic. Obviously, the absence of Quintana has completely determined the team's race. They started with seven men in the Vuelta and well. Let's say that they stood out in the race thanks to the fluorescent yellow jersey they wore, not because of their performance. De La Plaza and Gernalek abandoned the race halfway through and I can only highlight Maglay's third place in Breda and the breakaways of Guglielmi and especially Elijah Bird. Little or nothing else. The top 20 is started by Fred Ra and Ono, Barin Victorious, but from what we saw in the race, it could perfectly be called the team of Fred Wright and nobody else. What a vuelta for the Landismo. Thank goodness, Mikel warned us, but he didn't even fight for a single stage. Gino Mader, fifth last year, had almost no presence in the race, and it would have been nice to see a little bit more of Buitrago and Poils, although neither had stood out before having to leave because of Covid. The rookie San Manini was good on Mangy's day, and what about Fred Wright? He tried as hard as he could, on all terrains, but either he was unlucky or he was too hasty when it came to solving the breakaways. A second place in the sprint of the 19th stage, two thirds and two fourths. Incredible his performance and very bad for the rest of the team, obviously. We start the group of Spanish teams with Kern Pharma. The triple dropout before the 11th stage was very bad for them and deprived us to enjoy Roger Adria. They got some top 10s with Garcia Pierna, Berrade and Adria himself, but I didn't quite understand that conservative attitude of a couple of days in which they preferred to take shelter in the peloton instead of getting into the breakaway with Burgos, Escoltel or some other team, even if it was just to show the sponsors. Second among the Spanish teams invited, I have placed Euskaltel Euskadi. Like Burgos, they were in the breakaways for many, many days, with Vitoria, Joan Bow, who took the mountains jersey for a couple of days, and somewhat less so with Azparren and Mate in this respect. Luis Angel Mate, thanks to his efforts and after involving the Volta and the Euskadi Foundation, will help with 987 trees to repopulate the Sierra Bermeja. 
they came very close to a top 10 finish in the second stage with Carlos Canal, but they didn't achieve almost any other notable result. In 17th position, we have one of the teams with the least presence in the race, ag 2 If you take away Champoussin's efforts, they wouldn't have even been in the breakaway almost any day, as Nance Peters, Bob Jungels and company didn't do much, honestly. They lost Bendrome and Haninen early on to Covid and O'Connor, who wasn't in the best form of his life after the tour, just rode as long as possible with the favourites and took 8th place overall, nothing more. And the best of the Spanish teams that were invited was Burgos BH. Despite the last minute withdrawals of Angel Madrazo and a sprinter Manuel Peñalver, starting the race with only 7 men, they were present many days in the breakaways thanks to Ander Okamika, Jetsebol, Diaz and Dani Navarro. Besides that, they wore the mountains jersey for a couple of days with Victor Langolotti before he had to abandon and Jesus Esquerra made a couple of top 10s, with Cabello 22nd overall, if you want to highlight anything else. The best of the three Spanish teams in 2nd division. And we arrive to the top 15 with Grupama FDG. Quentin Pacher had a great Vuelta, 2nd on the day of Uran and another 3 places in the top 6. It's a pity his crash and withdrawal in the 18th stage, because he deserved to get to Madrid. Pinot was also quite good the last few days, getting a long way with the favourites, although if that form had come a little bit earlier, he would have taken a win, surely. Ray came back, supported him whenever he could in the breakaways, and Bruno Armirel was a bit of a disappointment before he dropped out with bronchitis. It was a shame to lose Jake Stewart on a stage 8th, as he looked very good in the first week, with Rudy Mollard wearing the red jersey for one day. In 14th position, we find Bike Exchange. If you lose one of the favorites who was fighting for a top 5 or even the podium in the middle of the race, then that's going to hamper you a lot, obviously. But I was very pleased with how the team responded on the day of Jade's withdrawal, with Caden Gross' victory. On the other hand, in the other sprints, he only made it to the top 10, nothing more. Of the rest of the team, I can only highlight Lawson Scraddock's commitment in the breakaways, as the rest of the team were domestics and Lucas Hamilton did nothing at all in the mountains. Kofidis is saved in 13th place thanks to Jesus Arrada, with a stage win and third on Rico's day. It's a very good performance from the Spaniard, with his brother standing out more on Twitter complaining after being forced to abandon. Brian Cocard didn't win, although he might have done so on the day of Montilla if he had been better placed. And I cannot say that much about the rest of the team, a little bit in the breakaways and helping their teammates, their leaders, but nothing else. In 12th position, I have placed Intermarché Wanty Grobert. They didn't even come close to last year's success and performance. It is true that they have been one of the most limited teams because of their withdrawals, with Jan Hirt and Van Poppel out because of Covid, Pozzo Vivo and Taramae sick the last days before abandoning, and Thyssen, who could not hold on after a fall in the second stage. At least, they get a stage win and a near top finish from Luis Mangis, a third from Taramae, and the breakaway presence of Backlands, much better than other teams. At the gates of the top 10, I've put EF Education Easy Post. Good thing they brought a Colombian rider named Rigoberto Ran, otherwise their performance would have been on par with Lotus and others. Very good stage win and top 10 overall for Rigo, but what about the rest of the team? Vandenberg did well being the first mountain jersey of the race and was in numerous breakaways. Mark Padon tried a couple of days but wasn't the Dauphiné 2021 version of him. And let's not even talk about the Vuelta of Hugh Carthy and Esteban Chavez. At least the latter has acknowledged that he was a disappointment. I don't have much to say about the other three, other than their help to the teammates and their presence in the breakaways. We start the top 10 with Bora Hansgrove. There is a lot of difference between the two blocks that they brought, day and night. On the one hand, Sam Bennett made amends after a very difficult season and dominated the two first sprints, although he had to abandon because of Covid before the 10th stage. That's a pity, as he could have won the next day when Danny Van Poppel almost won, who did a great job as his launcher. 
Jonas Koch and Ryan Mullen did well in this group, but we can't say the same about the climbers, with Hindley begging to get into the top 10, Kelderman the same until he suffered a crash that eliminated him from the fight and Sergio Higuita only excelling on the penultimate day of the race. We continue with Alpecin de Keuning in 9th place. They have to stage wins with Timberly, oh no, with Jay Van. A pity that he had to abandon on the 18th stage due to a fall because his two victories were incredible and he would have taken the Montes jersey for sure. And Merlier was missing, only being able to take part in three sprints and taking two third places as his best results. The Belgian was terrible. And I can only highlight a few things about the rest of the team, like the final attempt of Stannard to compete with Carapaz for the Mountains jersey, the third place of Gianni Vermeer in Talavera and something of Jimmy Janssen's. But we are done with that. Eighth in this ranking is DSM, of which only Time Menaresman can be highlighted. Like Rigo, he took a stage win and top 10 overall, sixth in his case, and was very close to taking the penultimate stage. I didn't expect him to last all three weeks, but hey, great for him, his level has been very high. We can also mention Marco Brenner, who looked good in a couple of breakaways, but Arden Donovan went out in the first week because of Covid, Van de Navili continued with his health problems and John Degenkolb got a couple of top times in the sprints. Very poor performance by the rest of the team. You take Arensman out and this team would be in the bottom half, as it had a very low quality. And in 7th place, I have placed Astana, in which we have to highlight two riders, Superman Lopez and Samuele Batistella. It's a pity that the Colombian lost time in the first mountain days, because in Sierra Nevada and La Pandera he was the strongest among the favorites and would have taken the podium, surely. Batistella was second in two breakaways before having to abandon due to fever and I can't say that much about the rest of the team. Lutsenko was in several breakaways but didn't achieve anything, De La Cruz was limited to helping Lopez in the mountains and Nivali did little, to be honest. I have given sixth place to Team Jumbo Visma. Had it not been for Robles with Rowell, they would have been higher and I didn't want to eliminate all the work they did for the Slovenian, even if he had to say goodbye to the race. Roglic, despite his injuries and pains, was Evenepoel's big threat, attacking on several occasions and winning on stage 4, but it all went down the drain on stage 16 with his crash, which he caused himself, however much he accuses Fred Wright. It would have been nice to see Seb Kass released after the leader's departure, but he went home on stage 9. Robert Gessing responded brilliantly to Roglic's absence and almost won on the pure now. Tony Sen tried a couple of sprints but lacked a little bit of punch. Chris Harper was very strong as Roglic last domestique in the mountains, Dennis didn't stand out much, and to be honest, Sam Oman destroyed the team tactics on stage 15. At least, they had the leader's jersey the first four days with four different riders. We opened the top 5 with Movistar. We had very little confidence in Enrique Mas, maybe even Unsue or himself didn't believe, but he has done an outstanding Vuelta. Yes, he would have launched very few of those serious attacks, preferring to look back quickly many times, but he was the only one able to keep up with Evan Nepoil in the first days and he was always there in front. From being psychologically sunk at the end of the tour to a second place in the Vuelta, I wish that the team had planned more aggressive strategies, because they helped, obviously, but it's a pity that Valverde and Verona didn't filter into more breakaways to act as satellite riders, like Oliveira, or opt for a stage win. Even so, Mass second place and the 1000 UCI points are enough to get them into the top 5. At the gates of the podium of the best we find Ineos Grenadiers, who, hey, they won't have won the Volta, and they won't be on the final podium as they expected, but Richard Carapaz raised his arms in three stages and took home the mountains jersey. He had a bad start to the Volta, but he redeemed himself in the best possible way. And if you add to that, Carlos Rodriguez brave seventh place in the overall, which would have been a top five if it wasn't for the after effects of the nasty crash he suffered 
in the 18th stage, well, hey, it's a good Vuelta. Ben Turner did a great job as a domestic. Tau Gegenhardt dropped his level after his fall in the 19th stage and was dedicated to help Carlos and it's a pity we couldn't enjoy Sivakov and Hater because of Covid, because they came in with a very good level. And we start the podium with Trek Segafredo, or the team that worked for one man and that same man worked for his teammates, Mats Pedersen. Three absolutely uncontested stage victories and three second places in the first three stages, not counting the team time trial. He achieved the green jersey with an abysmal margin, carrying bottles for his teammates even on the days he was winning and getting into the breakaways on mountain days to help them, one of the men of the race. And he achieved all of this even after losing Dan Hull at the start of the race, but if Kenny Lisong, Juan P. Lopez and others put in the hard work on the flat stages and replaced him, then hey, we are not going to complain. Juanpe had to quickly abandon his personal aspirations, his personal ambitions, after the blow he took on stage 6. In second position, I have placed the winner's team, Quickstep Alpha Vinyl. I don't think many of us trusted Renko to last the three weeks, but he was the strongest of the race. He took the red jersey on stage 6 and didn't let go, taking two stage wins along the way, exploiting his rivals on some days and knowing how to regulate himself on the days when he wasn't so good. Although he didn't have the strongest team, between Cavagna on the flat and Masnara, Luis Verweike, Van Wilder and Alaphilippe and Surrey before their respective dropouts, he was able to control any situation. Evan Epoel is the deserved winner of the Vuelta. We'll see what he's aiming for in the World Cup and next year. And the first place in this ranking, as well as in the team's classification, goes to UAE Team Emirates. Despite being a bit uncoordinated in some of the mountain stages, they managed to climb to the top of the podium. Marc Soler did an exceptional job as a domestic and in the breakaways, going at his own pace on the climbs and surprising his rivals in the fifth stage. Almeida, also at his own pace, managed to finish in the top 5 overall. Ponlang did quite well and took 12th and what can we say about Juan Ayuso? His first Grand Tour at the age of 19 and he finished 3rd. I didn't want to put pressure on him, but what he has done is not a 10, it's for an 11 or even a 12. In addition to all of this, Molano won in Madrid when he was launching Ackermann and the German was very close to victory in a couple of sprints. Maybe for some people that's not enough merit, but for me it is. And here ends my first video with the analysis of the 23 teams of this Vuelta España, an edition in which we have seen the awakening and confirmation of several young riders, the resurrection of Spanish hopes and Enrique Mas, the dominance of Mats Pedersen and Renko Evone Poel, and the commitment of Primoz Roglic, Richard Carapaz and Fred Wright. Don't forget to like the video, leave a comment down below and also subscribe to the channel if you want to. See you in a few days with a new video.